I guess some of you weren't out last night with me at Hacker Jeopardy, because you're very quiet. Um, hmm? Well, maybe, maybe later. This is being filmed for posterity, so I'm going to try to be a little bit politically correct as far as nudity is concerned in this talk. <clears throat> so I'm Big Easy. Um, Sashi is an interesting story because he doesn't exist. Um, I put in previously 15 CFPs for DEF CON and they've been rejected every year for the last 16 years. And this year, <clears throat> they said, oh, we really encourage people to put their handles in and be anonymous when they do the talk. So I used my handle that I've been using for a very long time. And then I invented Sashi because I thought it'd be cool to see if Sashi could get a talk at DEF CON even though he's only a web page. So I've done talks before about different parts of what this is becoming into um, going all the way back to Black Hat two years ago and our kernel work that we released at uh, B-Sides last year. And I apologize if my voice is a little rough, but I did win Hacker Jeopardy last night. We didn't fuck it up. So, but I want to say a, a word about that because apparently there was a shit storm in Twitter over Hacker Jeopardy and the dick category. And I would like to say that I'm a hacker. I've been coming to DEF CON for longer than I'd like to admit. And I'm an introvert. And DEF CON has always given me a charge to do things. And I hope that I can help get you guys to get a charge too. And all I want to say about Hacker Jeopardy is when you get completely humiliated on stage in front of thousands of people, how can we say that this is a male dominated game when I'm being beaten by women and painted green on the stage? But I'm not here to talk about that. I want to talk about this motherfucker. <laughs> so like I said, when I wanted, wanted to do this talk, and I put it in, just like every other good CFP, um, we had the idea that uh, it would be really cool if we could do some things, because I was concerned about my privacy. And um, you know, I got this from Chris Olson. I don't know if he's in the audience. I want to give him a shout out if he is. If he's out in the, in the uh, cyberspace, what an awesome uh, tweet. And there's old sock, camera covered with tape, mic jack covered with tape, and his email client is Thunderbird. And this really summarizes what I'd like to say about this idea of, um, <clears throat> I want my privacy back. Keep your code out of my stack. And, you know, everybody says I might be a little paranoid. So we put the talk in, and um, I thought I was going to get rejected, and shockingly, the talk was accepted. And that means that we then had to do a shitload of work because we actually had to do what we said we were going to do in the CFP. So we looked at a bunch of tools. I kind of included these uh, slides in as you navigate through the framework that uh, we're releasing today because we really looked at all the tools that were available uh, regarding what's happening inside the computer because I became very interested in what exactly happens when data is generated by peripheral devices such as your keyboard and mouse and then what's happening to your camera and microphone when you aren't aware that perhaps some processes are using those devices. So we looked at <clears throat> a lot of the tools that were available including the Nurisoft tools. And um, I used to have a slide with the author of these tools, but um, I kind of like maybe deleted it accidentally when the speaker goons were yelling at me to get on stage. Um, is the author of Nearsoft tools in the audience? Okay, so his tools are awesome. And then we all know TCP view from Microsoft. And I looked at these tools and said, these tools are really all cool, but what we want to do is write these tools from source code so that 
when you compile and run these things, you know exactly what's in the code. So the framework has these things, and I'll get on, I'll get on that later. We also looked uh, previously at uh, IRP Tracker, which is a really great tool that works in 32-bit systems, and IRP Mon, and I included the links to that in this talk just so you can have some background as you work and rock through some of the code. But, <coughs> and here's a screenshot of that. Um, and then we began to research looking at IRP Mon, and one of the things that was really irritating about uh, not irritating, but you know, it's always frustrating when you're on the command line. Is about, you know, lots of different errors that happen when you start to hook every driver that you have in your Windows operating system to try and see what's going on. And then you get a lot of weird messages because uh, IRP mine doesn't last very long. And then the other thing is you have to have your computer in test mode to even work this, and it's kind of like a scary mode to be in in Windows. Um, but I got a little bit ahead of myself <clears throat> because uh, this all started from some of the Badger research we did where um, I'm a really paranoid bastard. Um, my family can tell you that I record everything at my house. I have multiple taps running in my house so that I can track everything that's happening on my network. and. Um, I know everybody else has a Unix box at home with eight Ethernet interfaces. Um, and um, we use those, I use those interfaces to keep an eye on some data. And like, um, we were doing some research, and I accidentally le left a uh, TCP dump running and captured one billion packets in one file. And um, we looked at. <coughs> things from the inside and the outside. I call it the inside because it's inside my protection device and outside. It's very interesting to me that you see more traffic outside of your firewall than, than inside. And um, it's covered up in my screen, but not yours. I observed um, 29,829 destinations outside the firewall, 20, whoops, 29,525 reserve, resolve via reserve lookup. So they had good DNS. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of years later, I looked back at this again, and I noticed that the traffic coming out of my web um, connections was up, you know, about four times. And um, it was very disturbing because you'll be opening a web browser and uh, moving around the mouse inside the screen, and then you've got TCP connections opening all over the internet, and the data is all secured, and you have no idea what it is this data is, and <clears throat> where is it going? And then I forgot to remove the bullet at the bottom. So, but is it 1984? Because you know the, our mouse movements are being tracked. What about keystrokes? I started thinking, what about the microphone and video? Because there's just a huge amount of bloat. Everything in the traces that I'm running now is just a bit bloated. And um, somehow this slide got popped into here. You know, the IRP, looking at IRP, and then previous projects like IRP Tracker and uh, was limited because it didn't have 64 bits. But there's a great start in this with uh, Martin Drab. Thank God I wrote his name in the slides because I couldn't remember it. I, I burned all of my remembering points last night. Um, so Martin has done a great job with uh, IRP Mon starting this, but it's got a couple of things that um, <clears throat> were a bit of a, some, some downfalls if you actually wanted to inject data between, say, the keyboard and the browser. Uh, because the idea is, if I'm not using my keyboard and I want to send keystrokes to the browser anyway, uh, and if somebody wants to collect that and fill up their cloud with it, that's their own business because they shouldn't be peeking inside my window anyway. And um, we needed more precise data and information. Um, and then, <coughs> this is really irritating. There's a little screen popping up in front of my slide here. Device calls needed, 
we needed to have an in-memory data store of device calls. And um, our PMI was a great start, but then we went on and we, we've been writing things from scratch, just like everything else that we're going to be releasing. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to instrument the process, um, the process list. And then we were specifically interested initially in the keyboard, mouse, microphone, and video. Uh, some of these are easier than others, though, especially the microphone and video are a little more complicated. But um, what processes are actually interested in your mouse movements and then uh, what network traffic is then generated as a result of those calls? Um, and then we wanted to be able to correlate those calls back into the IRP request just to find out where does the forking occur? Because a lot of the forking occurs inside the browser. Um, and um, so that's gonna, that would require something like a browser plugin. And we really didn't want to support multiple browser plugins because there are many, many different browsers. So it was a very, it's been a very difficult challenge making a decision about where you actually want to put a man in the middle. <clears throat> and then we, always, we also had the big question about you know, why do we start in Windows 7, 8 when there's Windows 10? Um, you know, we're building this framework from scratch, and, you know, right now it's just fuck Windows 10 uh, because it's very scary to me what Windows 10 is doing, especially in terms of how much data is coming out, how much of my personal data is coming out in Windows 10. Um, <clears throat> and then we really wanted to meet our adversary at his own level of abstraction because it... It really helps us find making breaches of privacy uh, easier to look at and, and intercept because we have you know, two goals with the project is we want to maybe inject false data into our, um, from our devices into the cloud and we also want it to assert our privacy and block certain connections inside our operating system. So peeling back this level of abstraction proved to be very challenging to us as we became very familiar with the screen over and over again, working on this software, including until about 15 minutes ago, and we just kept trying over and over again <clears throat> to come up with some things that would actually compile and run. And in the meantime, I got sucked into playing Hacker, Hacker Jeopardy this weekend, which, uh, which was, has been a very interesting weekend for me, to say the least. But <clears throat> you didn't come here to necessarily see me talk about this stuff. And I really wanted to take a page back from old school DEF CON. And um, anybody remember the GTE door? So um, I talked about pulling the processes. And so the code for that kind of looks like this. Um, I want to say 90%, at least, of the code I'm showing today is already included in the CD. Um, this is pulling the process list. Um, so th this is the code that uh, we wrote from scratch to get the processes like you would see from um, <clears throat> Process Explorer. And the reason, again, like I said, we do this is because we wanted to provide two things to users of our software is that there was some kind of assurance there was nothing in the software that um, you didn't know about and um, it's not necessarily anything groundbreaking, but it just gives you a level of assurance because you want to be able to assert things with some kind of authority inside your own operating system that you have some modicum of privacy so that you don't have to tape up your, your, mic your microphone jack and your, and your camera like, um, like uh, paranoid people do from the beginning of our talk. But don't panic, there is a UI uh, so the team is bigger than me, and um, one of my uh, co-researchers, Kate Davis, happens to be a UI expert, and we're um, in alpha right now with a UI that will take all of our um, code and allow you to, um, we're going to visualize the data streams and allow you to click on individual data streams in a UI and not know anything about assembly programming, for example. But um, if the demo works out, we will see the client actually have it running in my computer right now. 
But <clears throat> more code first. Um, so, so there's a command line client that's going to be included in the release, and this is kind of like the code from that uh, to pull up the what we we built a net filter. Since we don't know where the data forks inside the browser, and we didn't want to spend a lot of we didn't have the time to go into every browser and figure out where this was this summer. Um, and then if anybody wants to help, I'd welcome them in the project. So we built a net filter that sat between everything and the um, network interface cards. And then um, if you're a command line kind of guy, this is kind of like the, the code that pulls up the, the, uh, the net filter so that you can shunt um, the, uh, the processes that you deem undesirable or the TCP connections that, um, for example, if you're going to foo.com or example.com and then you notice there's four other TCP connections going to third party um, site collection um, companies, uh, you can just choose to shunt those connections and your connection to foo.com will work just fine. Um, <coughs> So, some of this was written by Sashi, who, by the way, there, Sashi is a collection of folks that helped me, because um, this is a project that's bigger than one person. And uh, shout out goes to Sashi, you know who you are. Um, but um, we, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were providing you with clear and concise code that had a lot of um, comments in it so you knew what exactly all of this stuff was doing so you understood at least peripherally even if you're not a programmer what the code was doing if you were interested in that kind of thing because hiding um, and overusing privileges is rampant inside the operating system right now so um, this is a call-out function from the, from the net filter, um, and again, it's probably a, a wall of text or a real eye chart here. I really just included this in the CD so that uh, you could get a chance to see what was in the code and maybe actually show up to the talk, so apparently I didn't do very well because there's not a lot of people here. But oops, look at me. I went too far. <clears throat> So if you wanted to add a filter that references a call out, as documented in the Windows driver kit, you need to do some things. We need to call to the register and um, do some other calls. And then I've got some slides later that go into a little more detail on this. But I do want to introduce Sashi a little bit. If you actually go to this web address right now, you can see this web page. So when you get the code and you want to try it out, you can actually see how the man in the middle works and due to some internet difficulties because we are at DEF CON, I'm not actually going to demo this part. Uh, there's a lot of risk involved in that, but I do have some screenshots of what the site kind of looks like. Uh, so in the upper left-hand corner, you see uh, X, Y coordinates, um, and that would be where your mouse pointer is, and the box underneath that is a frame for keystrokes. And then uh, you can turn on the video and microphone, but I suggest that you mute your device because there's a bit of feedback involved. We didn't get that worked out in the code before the release. But if you hit the mute button, you can see the, the little blue in the bottom left-hand corner um, would, would strove to let you know that um, the microphone is still being streamed to the application, and you can actually put the website in the background and notice that the video and mouse are still being streamed to the application, even though you moved an application to the foreground and the web browser is in the background. Um, and then the website's just out there so that when, I've used a lot of tools that were released at DEF CON over the years and we wanted to really provide something that you could go to. And then we're also going to release the code for this web page so that you can just run it locally. But it kind of looks like um, when you intercept keystrokes It'll, they'll appear in the little box as showed, showed up there in the upper left-hand corner. 
Um, and then um, I'm going to flash back for a second. It's uh, www.cadego.com slash Sashi. So um, <clears throat> and again, I'm talking really fast, so that's good. So the tool chain um, completely consists of a UI client and something we call the Kona silos. And they're both still in alpha. They kind of work maybe on my computer, but they're not ready to be released yet. And then um, there's been, uh, you know, as always in, the, in a talk, last minute circumstances, um, I'd hope that the UI client would be a little further ahead in especially pulling up a lot of the pieces of code and we were going to compile everything so that we had a nice binary. But um, there was an unfortunate um, accident that prevented one of the coders from finishing their code. So we're just going to move right past that. But the framework will be released when it's ready, and I imagine it'll be ready in a, you know, soon TM. But um, a lot, the source code is ready to go, and it's probably going to go whenever I can find a safe internet connection again. And then you'll need your reading glasses for the wall of text that um, describes how you would actually do um, the injection. And then what we do, or what we what we decided on, is the best place to put uh, for injection right now because it's cool is um, is to build a net filter, not a net a filter in the driver. And um, this is a lot of explanation about exactly what's going on in the code. Uh, these slides are literally uh, 32 minutes old. Um, the people that were helping me, we were, we were awake all night uh, and actually split up across the property. So um, I apologize for the formatting of these slides. Um, and I'm gonna, we'll put the slides into the release, which is probably gonna happen later today so that you can get an idea. I don't wanna see you read this, but this comes straight out of the Microsoft site. They have very good instructions on how to actually write these filter drivers. And the structure for it kind of looks like this, and at least this is a little bit less of an eye chart. Here at the top, we have the upper level class filter drivers and the upper level device filter drivers as we push down towards the bus driver. And um, whoops, the code for how you would want to um, either intercept the calls that are going out into the operating system and then perhaps inject into them uh, kind of looks like this, where and then I didn't bring my glasses either, so um, I'm a little bit older now, and this code is really a wall of text to me too. But I'm going to be releasing this code with everything else later on today, hopefully. This code that we're looking at right here is building the net filter and then being able to... <clears throat> from here, we can manipulate all of the data from the keyboard to the upper layer of Windows. The callback function that we show here can intercept, um, as we have already described, but then we can also create an event in the OS to call and pass fake data. So the idea is this is a user-driven action, so from the UI or from the command line, if your kung fu is that way, you can um, direct the keyboard to type things either from a flat file or just randomly uh, for anyone who's interested in listening. And the way I feel about this is if somebody wants to listen to what I'm typing on my keyboard and I fill up their hard drives, or if we all get together and fill up their hard drives or, and, and monkey with their grand plan for advertising and um, making us forget about the things that are important. Um, fuck them. We all need to do something about this because it's running out of control. I want my privacy back. I don't want to have to worry about going into a Word document and um, having other people see what I'm typing into that document or even Notepad or something like that or if I type into a chat window uh, having a company decide that they would like to keep what was in the chat window even though I deleted it and never sent it to anybody. I think that's something that's personal and I'd like that to stay inside. And we want to really try to provide you tools 
that helps you do that. And just one guy, one paranoid guy like me doing this is not going to be enough. Um, and um, we need everybody to really sit and do this, which is why we're developing the UI. And um, kind of, it's been a very long, successful weekend for me. And let's see what happens when I do this. So the problem really is um, in the visualization, the client is kind of all there, but there's no, no compiled code hooked to it yet. And uh, this is one of the things where I need to apologize for not finishing in time, but there was unfortunate circumstances that prevented the finishing of this code. Uh, and it will be finished. Um, the visualizations, um, what we see is approximately um, 60 to 150 processes that can be easily visualized. And then the, the primary author of the UI is uh, one of my co-researchers. Her name is Kate Davis. She's also at the University of Illinois. I work at the University of Illinois during the day as well. This talk is not, uh, and the pinworm framework is not anything to do with my day job. Uh, this is a hobby that I do at night, like I've always done, and uh, the university has nothing involved with this presentation whatsoever, because I accidentally said where I worked. Not that it's a big deal, people know where I work. but. Um, so the UI is there, There's, the code is not compiled into it yet, and Kate can get to that when uh, the crisis uh, abates. So what's in the release? <clears throat> so, um, you know, we rely on IRP a little bit for a sniffer at instruments and device driver call so we can understand how to build a structure around anything that you might be interested in getting in the middle, provide a framework for um, cut and pasting code and writing your own uh, customized injectors for data and anything that you might see fit inside the computer. The HTTP server code uh, to display the metadata so that you can like mess around and you can, until somebody maybe hacks my uh, Sashi website out of existence, it'll be online, free to look at, or you can just run it locally and um, hack away at uh, injecting metadata into the little website. And then we included the man in the middle code for the interception of this data so that you can assert your privacy or perhaps um, send white noise out when you're not using a particular device. So um, I'm going to take the tinfoil hat off now. And I thank, I thank uh, Weird Al for being so gracious and letting me steal his picture. And I want to thank you. So did I make it in 45 minutes? Good. So it might be questions, I don't know. But um, there, was a, there was a demo of the actual injection, and the movie was made an hour ago. And it was going to be sent to me, but I was intercepted by, by, by these guys who wanted to make sure I was going to make it to stage on time. So. I'll get the, the movie of the actual injection out as soon as possible. I know that it exists. I just didn't get to it in time. I don't know. I asked for questions. I, I think I, I don't see it, anybody standing, so. So did it suck? I mean, holy shit. It seemed that it was... I don't need my voice anymore. Where, where do you see the most pernicious um, exfiltration of data? Is it from your keyboard? Is it from the observations of the, mic of the camera? Is it things that are hidden in the mouse that you don't really realize you're giving away? What, what bothers you most about the privacy in the computer? Well, that's an interesting question. Two things. First off, the thing that was really alarming to me, and I took the slides out for it, you can easily Google this. There are many companies that commercially provide a heat map of where all the user's mouse strokes go. And this is, this is a tool that is being commercially offered by a lot of different companies. To say, oh, these are, these are the places where everybody goes. And I can understand that functionally as a website designer, they may 
think that that data is interesting, but as a user, it really creeps me out because I don't want anybody to know where my mouse is. I don't want anybody to know that. It's not their business. But I think the answer to the question is the microphone. Um, to be frank, the microphone is so scary, I had to redact parts of my talk. There is a lot going on there, and it will be very eye-opening when you run the code, what is going on inside your computer, especially with the microphone. Thanks for the question. And again, either I sucked or everybody's like, what the fuck just happened? This guy. <clears throat> now, I want to say I survived a B-Sides talk Wednesday where I released a different set of open source software. I sat next to Dan Kaminsky Friday night. I drank eight beers in 30 minutes. I sat next to Banshee last night, drank 10 beers. I was up all night last night. And I think I made it through at least 31 minutes of talk without sucking too bad. And, but holy shit, it's Sunday. I know everybody's all racked out. Fuck, I know I am. <clears throat> um, I think I survived it. So I want to thank you guys. It has been a pleasure to be at DEF CON for the last 16 years as a user. And I would like to thank every goon that has made this possible. They are the true stars of the show. And, and um, just as a parting shot, I want, who can be louder, you guys or me? No contest? My, I'll see you at the award ceremony. <laughs>